Welcome back, everyone. Today we're going to combine lessons from two of your course chapters. Chapter 9, which will discuss organization and outlining, and Chapter 14, which will discuss using visual aids like PowerPoint in your presentation. Because your outline and your multimedia components for your presentation are so inextricably linked, it just makes sense to talk about both of these chapters in the same breath. Let's get started. What you see here is an excerpt from CEO Brent Weaver's ex uh, article, The Worst Presentation I Ever Gave. In a few hours, he says, prior to standing before them, choking on my tongue, I decided to gut my entire presentation. I had given the same presentation just two days earlier in San Francisco. I didn't like it. I don't know why I didn't like it, but I didn't. It wasn't me. It wasn't from the heart, I guess. This was a business conference. You might wonder, does it need to be from the... Yes, always. If you can't speak from the heart, then get off the stage. I decided to fall back on some content that I had published in one of our professional communities a few weeks prior. I was a bit worried, later validated, that this would disengage people in the audience that were members of our site, but I did it anyway. I looked up. I was speaking ninth out of ten. Even though I'm usually pretty good in front of an audience, watching eight great presentations wore me thin. My confidence waned. I forgot what the heck I was doing there. If you're speaking any time soon, consider your presentation. Look at your deck. Ask yourself, is this just information or is there a story here? Challenge yourself to turn that conference room into a campfire. I've since taken this approach, and while not perfect, I'm making noticeable improvements every time I get in front of an audience. I'm less stressed, I'm more likely to lose myself in the moment. Already you can probably see that there are some hallmarks of the previous characteristics that we've spoken about in our other lectures and discussions, such as the need for integrity, credibility, not showing your audience the same old shtick, and making sure that what you say is from the heart, generating rapport. But we also have something very important here, the fact that Weaver gutted his entire presentation. One of the reasons why we never go grocery shopping when we're hungry is so that we don't buy the entire store and so we don't eat too much. In other words, we choose not to make important decisions when we're likely to be at our most irrational. And the same is true when we are composing our speeches. That's one of the reasons why it's important to develop a structure, an organization, and of course, an outline. Outlines take decisions away from us. Think of them like a, a grocery list that you take with you. So even when you're at your most hungry, you know to stick to that list so you'll continue to make rational decisions even when you're under stress. So, let's talk about the components of an outline. No matter what class you're taking, no matter what project you're working, there are generally four distinct parts to an outline. The proposition, the attention getter, the ideas, and the items. Let's talk about them in a little bit more depth, even though your course textbook talks about each of these and extrapolates upon them in some length. A proposition is virtually the same thing as a topic. Sometimes this might be called a thesis statement or a main idea, depending upon whether or not it's an argument or just a specific area of knowledge that you're sharing with your audience. An attention getter which we've already talked about in prior discussions regarding introductory methods, is not only iterating your goal, but it's addressing your audience's expectations and the tone and setting of the venue. Think of it like this. If your proposition is a holiday, then your attention getter is how you're going to decorate your front door or your porch in order to get people to understand what holiday it is and what the tone of that holiday might be. So if you decorate your front porch and your front door with skeletons and scary monsters, they know what the tone is and they know that the holiday is Halloween. But if you decorate it with, with a wreath that smells like cinnamon and nutmeg and vanilla cookies, and the rest of your porch is decorated with very homey and earthy attire, then they probably know it's going to be a very warm presentation and they can probably guess the holiday as well. Ideas 
make up the body of your presentation, and they refer to the personal contributions that you've acquired or your own unique understanding of a topic, and that's an imperative, your understanding of the topic. It's not simply reiterating a series of facts or providing a survey of the articles that you've researched. It's what you understand about the topic that nobody else does and your reason for sharing that topic with the audience. And finally, items. These are what you support your ideas with. Data, concepts, illustrations, etc. Items support ideas. Ideas support your proposition. And your proposition or your topic is the reason that you're sharing your speech with your audience. So what are the three main types of outlines that you're likely to use? Well, typically, most outlines fall into three patterns, either decimals or bullet point outlines, full sentence outlines, or alphanumeric outlines. Decimal outlines are probably the sorts of outlines you may have already used intuitively on our two previous informal speeches. They're just a, a series of bullet points and that can be good or bad. It's good because that means the decimal outlines tend to be dynamic, they can be easily assembled, and they're ideal for conceptual items or things that don't necessarily have anything to do with each other except for the fact that they all relate to your speech topic. Decimal outlines can also be good for cooperative or collaborative creation or construction. Whenever you're working in a group and you're brainstorming ideas for a, a collective presentation, oftentimes decimal outlines can supply you with the means to not edit yourself or correct yourself until after that group goes from the storming to norming stage. Full sentence outlines are the exact opposite of that. They tend to be incredibly formal, and the more formal the venue, the more formal your outline tends to be. Number one, because full sentence outlines can give a very accurate portrayal of how long or the length of your presentation. And in formal venues, sometimes the venue will need to calculate by the minute how long each part of a particular assembly of speakers, etc. is going to take. And sometimes formal venues need to know approximately what you're going to say so that they can share a forecast or a preview of that on social media, marketing, etc. So, full sentence outlines draft and emphasize things like grammar and syntax, specific word choices, etc. The ports that Goldilocks chose between these two outlines, the type that we're going to use for our third presentation that's going to be due in a very short while, is the alphanumeric outline. This is an outline that intermingles dynamic structures with a formal capacity. In other words, it has a definitive chronology, start, a middle, and an end, just like a full sentence outline. But it also allows the speaker to intermingle the dynamic structure of the decimal structure as well, allowing you to copy, paste, cut, and generally create a more dynamic flow to your organization. Let's look at a sample of the alphanumeric outline. You'll notice the reason why it's called an alphanumeric outline, because it has a mixture of Roman numerals, capital letters, and, of course, Arabic numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. Your main points are going to be your introduction and your main ideas. Subpoints are the ideas that relate to those main ideas, and sub-subpoints, if you have any, are things like your data and items. As you can see, this person has two main points in the body of their presentation. And it looks like their second main point is somewhat more substantive in data, which means they're probably going to end with that in order to make a real impact on their audience. Let's look at a brief workshop or exercise related to this. Sometimes we need to choose what's going to work and not work in regards to our topic or our thesis in relationship to our ideas. So, for example, one of, or perhaps more than one of, the ideas related to each of these topic sentences might not belong. Let's look at the topic sentence, my favorite food is pizza. 
if you carefully read each of these sentences, you'll probably notice that my brother only likes pizza with anchovies and artichokes on it doesn't necessarily fit, at least the same way that the other three statements do. So that means that this particular speech probably needed to be reduced from four ideas to three ideas. Remember, your items support your ideas. Your ideas need to support your thesis or topic. Let's look at the second topic sentence. My most boring class is algebra. Carefully examining all of the rest of those seven sentences, we can see that there are at least two of those seven sentences that don't necessarily belong. Number one, obviously number seven probably doesn't make sense. Now, it's true that sometimes a boring teacher can also be a teacher that's a bully. But since the topic is about the boring class, that doesn't necessarily make this particular idea appropriate for this speech. Probably needs to be shelved for a future opportunity. Also, we might be able to omit or evade sentence number three. Never have a free minute to myself. While it might be subsumed in something like sentence number two, all we ever do is work, 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 just as number five might be subsumed into an idea about the teacher speaking in a monotone and telling the same jokes, most likely it could be lanced from the speech altogether. Since it's a redundancy for sentence number two, and thus it doesn't need to be said. So we've reduced the total number of ideas from seven to five. And if we collapse a few of these together, we could probably eliminate number five, or at least combine four and five to have four total ideas. Again, writing and composition are not the same thing as math. We don't always have to start at the beginning, go all the way to the end, and then stop. In fact, it's best when we create an outline to start developing what the items and ideas are going to be, sometimes even before we develop our topic. Because that way, we'll have a more clear sense of what our topic's going to be, and we won't have to do quite as much revision. Let's talk about that in a little bit more detail. We'll end with a few observations about outline strategies. The first being that outlines are linear, but composing outlines are nonlinear. Just as we've already iterated, you don't necessarily have to start with your introduction when you're working on your outline. It's probably best to grassroots your outline starting with some of the smallest elements and building up from there. Your audience is never going to know that you didn't start at the beginning and go all the way to your conclusion. That's why we use an alphanumeric or decimal system, so that you can cut, paste, and reframe your outline until it makes a chronological sense. Also, strong outlines prevent extensive revision. In other words, if you work very hard on your outline, you probably won't have to revise your speech too much. And this goes back to what we've already iterated about not grocery shopping when you're hungry. A good grocery list will prevent you from extraneous or superfluous pur purchases. Same is true for an outline. It eliminates choice from your planning. Just at the time when you're probably going to make your most irrational decisions, when you're suffering from anxiety or under stress of finishing your composition. And this goes to our third point. <clears throat> the time that you spend on your outline is often proportional to the labor that you put in the first draft of your composition. In other words, the more time you spend on your outline, the less time you'll probably have to spend overall developing or refining the first draft of your composition. So, with that in mind, folks, we're going to watch a brief presentation. What I'd like you to do as you look at this presentation is maybe try a little outlining yourself. Try to reverse engineer this person's speech. And also, since this person is using PowerPoint, you might think about how well or maybe even how not well they're using PowerPoint, as well as developing a couple of observations about how they're doing in their speech overall.
many of you know this familiar face? Did you know that this man created the happiest place on earth? Today I want to talk about Walt Disney and his invention of animated films as well as the Disney parks across the world. Walt Disney has made an incredible impact on the world as he expresses creativity through short clips, movies, and theme parks. Children of all ages can enjoy the movies Disney created over the years as well as going to the Disney theme parks throughout the world and experiencing the Disney environment. First, I'll talk a little bit about Walt Disney's background and childhood. Next, I'll inform you about some of the animated films Disney created over the years. Then, I'll share with you the invention of the Disneyland and Walt Disney World parks. Finally, we'll discuss the future of Walt Disney's name and work. First, let's talk about the inventor, Walt Disney. He was born on December 5, 1901, and was one of five children in his family. His father was Elias Disney and his mother was Flora Paul Disney. Disney and his family lived frequently throughout his early life, but for the most part, he grew up in Marceline, Missouri. As far as education, Disney attended multiple places, including Kansas City Art Institute and School of Design and Chicago Art Institute, which furthered his creative mind in achieving his success as an inventor. Trains were a big interest in the mind of Disney, and he even built a railroad in his own backyard to express his passion for trains. Biography.com helped me find these facts about Walt Disney's early life. Despite all of his early success, Disney went through a rough time before his career skyrocketed. In an attempt to impact the world, Disney, together with iWorks, began creating short animated films in 1922. Their first two projects were off to a great start, but then something horrible occurred. They ran out of money, and Disney had to file for bankruptcy. They, uh, you would think something like this would end Disney's career, but the bankruptcy did nothing but motivate him to further pursue his ideas he had in mind for the world. He immediately moved to California with only $40 cash and a suitcase with an extra change of clothes. He began talking to people and forming a dedicated team so that he could get right back on track in the animation business. Although Walt Disney went through some downhills in his early career, he found a way out and began to quickly succeed in the film industry. Next, let's look at Disney's successful animated films he created. Disney's first successful silent cartoon was called Plain Crazy. It screened for the first time in 1928 and starred the famous mouse that everyone is fond of today, Mickey Mouse. After Plain Crazy, Steamboat Willie was created and screened for the first time in 1928. The difference between these first two successful films was that Plain Crazy was a silent film and Steamboat Willie made history as the world's first synchronized sound cartoon. Due to the success of his first sound cartoon, Disney was motivated to elevate his ideas by producing longer animated films. Some of these films included Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Fantasia, and Dumbo. Disney became so successful in the film industry that he won almost every award he was ever nominated for. JustDisney.com informed me on the successful films Disney created. Although Disney probably could have lived off of the successes of his films, Nothing stopped him from further attempting to create theme parks based off of these outstanding films. Disney was very successful in the film industry, but there was also another successful industry in Disney's near future, theme parks. Now, let's discuss Disney's invention of Disneyland and Walt Disney World. Disneyland was created in one year on the acres near Anaheim, California. Opening day was July 17, 1955, and it was an incredible success, even though the park only consisted of about 20 attractions at the time. The real reason Disney wanted to create Disneyland was because kids started asking to see where Mickey Mouse and Snow White lived. Disney, being the incredibly giving person he was, immediately began brainstorming on how to make this dream come true for children. About.com helped me become aware of how Disney became successful in the amusement park industry. Walt Disney World was built near Orlando, Florida, and it took about two years to complete. Opening day was October 1st, 1971. Walt Disney died in 1966, so he did not get to experience the opening day of Walt Disney World, but his brother, Roy E. Disney, followed in his footsteps and made sure that everything was completed the way Walt wished it would be. I used WDW Magic to further educate me about the history of Walt Disney World. Roy E. Disney succeeded in taking over his brother's life, and both parts have continuously been growing in size, including scenery and new attractions. Finally, let's conclude by revealing the future of Walt Disney's name and work. Disney parks have not only expanded to different parts of the United States, but are also expanding to different parts of the world. There are 11 theme parks in 11 locations worldwide, which runs by Disney. A few places include Hong Kong Disneyland, Disneyland Resort Paris, and Tokyo Disney Resort. The TravelGuide.com states that Disneyland parks are the most famous theme parks of the world. Without the creativity and mind of Walt Disney and the lending hand of his brother Roy E. Disney, who knows where kids would spend their favorite vacation? 
Where will a park be built next? Walt Disney has impacted this role by making his parks international and always including children of all ages. And in conclusion, despite his tough childhood and lack of money at a young age, Disney succeeded in his dreams of making an impact on the world and creating a legacy forever. Walt Disney has created movies and theme parks in order to satisfy children of all ages. How many of you have been to one of the Disney theme parks? Do you agree that it is the happiest place on earth? The invention of Disney movies and theme parks has impacted us in such a way that even adults love Disney as much as little children. Without Walt Disney's incredible inventions and business and financial success, who knows what the happiest place on earth would be. Disney has opened up a door for all of us to be a kid again and experience a joyful environment of Mickey Mouse and all of his friends. And remember, it was all started by a mouse. Thank you. All right, folks. So there's a couple of observations that we could make about this particular presentation. Let's start by just noting that this person's PowerPoint software was fairly well synchronized. Did you notice that she didn't ever have to once touch or move on from one slide to another? So obviously she was using a formal outline structure. But that's also a challenge for this particular presentation. Because she wasn't using index cards, she tended to hide her delivery behind 8.5 by 11 sheets of paper. That probably damaged her rapport quite a bit as well. You'll also probably have noticed that this person's sources were sometimes a little bit evasive, using .coms instead of more credible publications. So this could have damaged her credibility, because we know that commercial websites probably aren't as interested in giving accurate information are probably more interested in just enticing individuals to visit certain websites, locations, or purchase certain products. Probably the most profound or overwhelming challenge or problem with this presentation, problems that this person would need to address if they need to give this speech again in subsequent settings or venues, is the issue of structure and organization. Is this person speaking about theme parks, or is this person speaking about the biography of Walt Disney? What this presentation felt like is a little bit of a Wikipedia article instead of a honed and focused presentation. So this just speaks to the fact of how important it is to have a very clear organization and structure when you develop your own outlines, especially if you're going to start working on multimedia components such as PowerPoint, which you may do for either this presentation or the presentation at the end of the term according to your course prompt. So let's talk about some general considerations for PowerPoint composition. Number one, as you probably already read, you need to convey no more than one idea per slide so that you do not confuse your audience. So that means in an approximately four to five minute presentations, you shouldn't have more than approximately four to five slides, an introductory or attention getter slide, a concluding slide, and approximately one slide per idea. Supplement and never, re and never repeat information in your slide presentation. In other words, your audience should look to you as the main source of information rather than your slide deck. And of course, make appropriate and uniform choices. If you are going to use, for example, a special transition, use the same transition every time. We've probably all seen a person that's used PowerPoint before that just learned how to use it, and they are very, very excited about that. So every transition is a, a train whistle or a toilet flush. There's a star wipe at one end and a flush wipe at the other. And all of these are certainly nice, and they certainly demonstrate a person's love for using multimedia software, but they don't necessarily enhance the presentation. It's also important to distribute materials at optimal times. This isn't necessarily important for this presentation, but if you ever find yourself giving a professional presentation later in life, it's probably a good idea to hand out things like outlines and handouts after you've given your speech. That way, all of the attention of your spectators is going to be on you for the duration of the presentation. Finally, arrive early to your presentation site. Now, of course, this isn't important because our presentations are generally going to be done in the comfort of your own home. But 
If you find yourself giving a professional presentation at a conference site, business center, or other location, you want to give yourself ample time to double-check equipment to make sure your slide deck is going to show up appropriately. Let's talk about appropriate fonts and syntax to use. Number one, always try to avoid all caps. All caps, all the time, kind of ruins the magic of all caps. Now, that doesn't mean you can never use all caps when you want to emphasize particular words, phrases, or make a point. But it's just a better idea to avoid all caps all the time. Otherwise, you look like you're shouting. It's also important to stray away from too many abbreviations during your presentation. You want your audience to be asking what you're going to say next or how you're going to pr prove certain propositions, not trying to decipher what you're actually saying. Just like the rule of five, which states that you shouldn't have more than five bullet points per index cards and no more than five words per bullet point, you should probably try to follow the rule of seven on your slides, no more than seven lines per slide and no more than seven words per line. Also, not a bad idea to avoid flashy fonts. Not necessarily important for this presentation, but even if you found a particularly outlandish and wonderful font, it looks like the logo from your favorite television series, for example. Remember that that download you downloaded might not be on someone else's computer or PC or whatever you're going to use if you use another person's device for your presentation. And whatever it defaults to might be something like Wingdings or Klingon or something like that. So always try to use default font schemes that are provided in every software package. An appropriate font size tends to be somewhere between 18 to 36 inches. Anything smaller than 18? And probably people at the back of your venue are going to have difficulty seeing it. Anything bigger than 36 for anything but a title you could be running into the all caps problem. Also, avoid difficult color schemes. Now, this particular image can be seen pretty well, but I've actually projected this very slide on projectors in the past, and the word color was completely blanched. Finally, spell check and proofread often. Just because it doesn't have a red squiggly line under it doesn't mean you don't need to get a friend or a roommate or even a relative to look carefully at what you've written. Just as an anecdote, I had a student several years ago that decided to do a presentation on the Oklahoma City public school system, and they left out the L in public on their very first slide. As you can imagine, the audience degenerated into Snickers for the rest of their presentation, and that problem could have been evaded if they'd have just gotten another pair of eyes to carefully look at their slide deck. So, Let's look at a couple of slides, try to identify what might be wrong or what could be improved with them. Yikes. This one obviously has a problem with color scheme. Not only is the legibility being brought down, but it's important to understand that what looks nice to you on an 8.5 by 11 laptop is going to be magnified sometimes 15 to 25 times over whenever you present it to an audience. So the hot pink fuchsia background with neon green letters that you just love so much might make people's eyes bleed if you project it. I'm having trouble looking at this, both reading it and just on an aesthetic level tolerating it. Design for social change. Great! Only I'm wondering why there's a hot dog and a rabbit on here, and I'm asking myself what weird assets are. Whenever your audience is having to decipher what you're saying, instead of having the information that you supply simply reinforce or supplement your presentation, chances are you're going to distract them or split their attention, and that's never a good thing. Wow. I appreciate that this person knows how to use Google Image Search. I just wish that they'd be a little bit more focused in their use of it. I don't know what they mean by buying a new suit. Do they mean that we should be excited about buying a new suit? Are they giving us information about the appropriate ways to buy a new suit? Again, because this particular slide doesn't have a focus, doesn't have a central idea that would support a larger topic, 
I don't really know what I'm supposed to pay attention to. And thus, this slide has become a distraction rather than an enhancement to the presentation. Well, if you need me to look at any of your slide decks between now and the time that you give your presentation in about 7 to 10 days, I'd be happy to do so. Simply send me an email and attach your presentation to that email, even if it's just a hyperlink to a Google slide deck. In the meantime, folks, I'm looking forward to your responses and your discussion journal entries, and I promise that I'll be evaluating several batches of those discussion journal entries in a very short while.